May 19th, 1998, Priesthood History in 5th through 8th grade. I ask that Heavenly Father will bless me with the spirit of peace and also all of you. In talking of history, all we want to know is the truth, never feelings or criticism. Telling the truth, we must tell of what men did. Priesthood history is the history of the Lord's prophet, the key holder, and what the Lord had him do. We have handed you a piece of paper showing you priesthood succession in this dispensation. On one side are the list of the key holders, Joseph Smith, Brigham Young, John Taylor, John W. Woolley, Lauren C. Woolley, John Y. Barlow, Leroy S. Johnson, and Ruland T. Jeffs. Next is the list of apostles ordained by Lauren Woolley in order of ordination. And after that, apostles ordained by John Y. Barlow in order of ordination. The last list to help you remember or see, we've also printed on the other side of this paper, the pictures of these apostles ordained by John Y. Barlow. I would like the teachers now to have on your chalkboard somewhere a growing timeline, naming priesthood events and have the students add to their timeline so that when we're complete with the history of this century, we will see the time sequence. So teachers take good notes especially, even work together and get the main events on the timeline. If I don't give an exact date, you can call me or search it out. In our last sessions we talked about the manifesto that Wilford Woodruff signed where John Taylor saw a future president would sign that document. Today, the Mormon Church is Gentile and apostate. Their condition resulted from one compromise after another. And we see, as it was with the Church, so it will be in people's individual lives that if we give up even one principle the priesthood teaches, gradually we will give them all of, or most of them. And apostates from this priesthood become worse than the Gentiles. Today, we know the Mormon Church is the great and abominable church. Because, as the Book of Mormon teaches, any church that fights against God, that is the great and abominable church. The stories I will tell you will be stories of faithfulness and also stories of how the Mormon church became the persecutor of the priesthood, all because of the government pressure. The Lord had instructed the prophets, do not give in to the government. But Wilfred Woodruff wanted to take care of the temporal salvation of the church, preserve its houses and lands and buildings and monies, more than the principles of the gospel. We've also taught you Uncle Roy's words. When Wilfred Woodruff signed the manifesto, he not only signed away his and the church's rights to the celestial law of marriage, but he signed away his rights to the priesthood also. That was a turning point, and thereafter, if you follow the ways of the people, the Mormon church compromised in nearly everything. They gave up the temple garments, Eventually, in this century, they changed the endowments in the temple. 
They gave up their proper dress and started allowing the people to go naked. They gave up the proper hair. And today, people in that church do about anything they want as long as they pay their tithing and acknowledge the president of the church. But be all that as it may, we look at it only as a warning that we cannot give up any of the principles of the priesthood. On your paper now, I would also like you to name the presidents of the church up to a certain point. You do know Joseph Smith, Jr., Joseph Smith the prophet, was president of the church until he died. Next was Brigham Young. You see the dates on your list here. The dates I am naming are the dates they were sustained by the church as the president. These dates on your priesthood succession list are the dates they became the keyholder of priesthood. To be president of the church, the people of the church vote and uphold or sustain that, prof that president. The president of the church is not necessarily the prophet, the keyholder. Whoever the people of the church want, that's who they can have. So the most important list for you to memorize are the key holders from Joseph Smith to Ruland Jabs. But once again, list these names. Joseph Smith, then Brigham Young, December 27th, 1847. That's when he was upheld by the church as president of the church. He was already president of priesthood. He died August 29th, 1877. John Taylor, he was sustained October 10th, 1880. Write these dates down. October 10th, 1880, as president of the church. He was 72 years old. He died July 25th, 1887. The next man that the church upheld as their president was Wilford Woodruff, sustained April 7th, 1889. He died September 2nd, 1898, around nine years. He was president of the church. I put the pictures on as I name them. The next president of the church was Lorenzo Snow. Lorenzo Snow was a faithful man. He was sustained as president of the church September 13th, 1898. He died three years later, October 10th, 1901. Write those dates down. Next, Joseph F. Smith, the man whom John Taylor placed under covenant to keep plural marriage alive. Joseph F. Smith was a good friend of John W. Wally. He became president of the church October 17th, 1901. And he died November 19th, 1918. President of the church about 17 years. You see his picture there? The son of Hiram Smith. The next president of the church was Heber J. Grant. Sustained as president November 23rd, 1918. And he died May 1945. Because 
Many of the priesthood holders were members of the church through those years of hiding. We will tell stories of these men who were the president of the church at that time. By the time of Heber J. Grant, nearly all the sifting had taken place and people had come out of the church. Those who were cast out of the church continued even up to Uncle Roy's time. But the greatest sifting took place in the days of Heber J. Grant. He was the seventh president. Remember John Taylor said by the time of the seventh president, the church would go into bondage both spiritually and temporally. Heber J. Grant was that man. While these men were president of the church, we know who the key holders of priesthood were. These men should have submitted to the key holder. And therein was the controversy. Heber J. Grant wanted to be called the prophet instead of John W. Woolley. He didn't want John W. Woolley to have that position. But the Lord makes a man the prophet. The people do not. Put on the picture of Francis and Lyman. Many of the leaders of the church thought that the manifesto should, should just be a covering for the church activities. And many of the leaders of the church went about performing endowments and marriages. This was a time of great trial through the 1890s and the early 1900s. A time where men had to have their loyalty straight or they could be found in transgression. As far as we know, Lorenzo Snow was faithful to the end. He was the president of the church for three years. He was the one that came into that position after Wilford Woodruff died. Yet he continued the policies of the church, where the church had given up plural marriage. As far as we know, he did not give up his wives, but continued faithful. When Lorenzo Snow died, in a very short time, Joseph F. Smith, being president of the Twelve, was nominated and sustained as president of the church. And Joseph F. Smith was very faithful. But through the 1890s and into the early 1900s, that first decade, the government continued the pressure. Word came out that certain leaders of the church, certain apostles, had received plural wives after the manifesto. So the government threatened to bring the same pressure, take away the property, persecute the saints. And members of the church, the leadership of the church, did not want that. This man, whose picture you see, is named Francis M. Lyman, became president of the Twelve during the time of Joseph F. Smith. And Francis M. Lyman set about to drive plural marriage out of the church. Yet here was the president of the church, Joseph F. Smith, who would not give up his wives. He openly lived with them. He had children still by them. I shouldn't say openly, he was careful, but he would not give them up. But Francis M. Lyman, being president of the Twelve, brought about pressure, trying to convince the other members of the Twelve to give up plural marriage among them and stop the secret marrying or marriages 
in the celestial law. To do this, he had to have a majority of the twelve apostles who were against plural marriage. The government was bringing pressure on. There were new hearings, apostates, and others weak in faith had gone to the government and told on the leaders of the church that recommends were still being given for plural marriage. The prophet John W. Woolley for a time worked in the temple and there were certain marriages being performed in hiding. Around the year 1906 or 7, the Salt Lake Tribune published a list of people's names who had entered into plural marriage after the manifesto. And this riled up the government and the people. And it brought great persecution upon those people. Francis M. Lyman set about to destroy this effort of continuing marriage, celestial and plural marriages. I'm just searching for a date. In the year 1905, on October 6th, after great pressure, John W. Taylor and Matthias F. Cowley were convinced to resign from the Quorum of the Twelve. The reason was the government was bringing pressure on the church that year because these names were becoming public of many plural marriages being performed with the knowledge of the leaders of the church. To take the pressure off they convinced these two apostles to resign. And in their places, David O. McKay, and Orson F. Whitney were put in the Quorum of the Twelve. And at that point, the majority of the Twelve would vote against plural marriage and not allow any more recommends to be given. They bound the hands of Joseph F. Smith. Now the church was turning into the, to become the persecutor against the priesthood. Now a majority of the twelve apostles were against plural marriage. That did not take the priesthood away from those men. John W. Taylor is the son of John Taylor the prophet. And John W. Taylor was faithful to the end, had many wives and children, and would not give them up. But Francis M. Lyman put him on trial, until finally Francis M. Lyman caused that John W. Taylor should be cut off the church. And this seemed to be the start of cutting people off the church for plural marriage where people were cast out of the church now not just persecuted by the government but the leaders of the church would excommunicate those who live plural marriage and they concentrated on John W. Taylor there were other people entering into marriage in hiding that the leaders of the church did not know about. But John W. Taylor was very public, one of the twelve apostles. I hope tomorrow we can get a picture of him. <coughs> the sifting took many years to take place. People either upholding it and giving up their membership in the church, or giving up plural marriage to keep their membership in the church. It was a great test, a great trial to them. For they, most of the people by the 1890s and early 1900s, 
had been born in the church. It was their tradition. They were taught they could only have eternal life if they were members of the church and could receive their endowments in the temples built by the church. Can you see how that would be a great trial? To believe that and then to be cast out because you were faithful. A person had to have a testimony, had to know who the prophet was, be determined and love the principles of the gospel in order to endure such a test. Joseph F. Smith was called before the Senate of the United States as a witness in the Reed Smoot hearings. Where Reed Smoot was elected to be a member of that body of the of Congress. But the senators there wondered if Reed Smoot and the church still upheld plural marriage. Joseph F. Smith in those hearings upheld the law. He said he would not give up his wives. But I'm showing you that the government pressure continued and now the leaders of the church, even though Joseph F. Smith was the president, the twelve apostles bound Joseph F. Smith so he could not do anything in defense of this law except live it himself. They even caused Joseph F. Smith to sign a paper that the church was no longer performing those marriages in order to get the government pressure off. Joseph F. Smith, as president of the church, would go and counsel with John W. Woolley. People heard how he would come and visit John W. Woolley. And John Y. Bartle, being a witness to it, said, John, Joseph F. Smith was seeking counsel from the prophet. So we know Joseph F. Smith was faithful, standing by the prophet. But he had to do so much counseling secretly. This Francis M. Lyman would die before he could become president of the church. There are other stories concerning these men. Put on Joseph F. Smith's picture. The prophet John Taylor, by command of the Lord, put John W. Woolley, Lawrence C. Woolley, and those other men at the 1886 meeting under a covenant of secrecy. They were to defend the law of celestial and plural marriage. And they were put under covenant to not go public, but to quietly keep it alive. It was their mission to teach only those in secret whom the Lord revealed they could trust. It was not their mission to hold meetings, to go about and teach it, inviting the people in to public meetings. And so from 1885, February 1st, until 1934, the priesthood was in hiding. But the leaders of the church knew about the activities of John Woolley and Lauren Woolley to a degree. There would be people spying on them, telling the leaders what they were doing. The leaders of the church found out about the 1886 revelation and who was there. And they were determined to cast out of the church anyone who upheld the idea that someone else held the authority. But John Woolley and Lauren Woolley and the others went quietly about their business. When the leaders of the church found out what John Woolley's claims were, they wanted to put him in jail, persecute him. 
But Lauren Woolley knew much about the leaders of the church. And he defended his father. Telling them he would see them go to prison if they persecuted his father. Because Lauren Woolley knew the leaders of the church, still the leaders who were persecuting the priesthood, had also entered into that law or had committed sins that he knew about. So there was this controversy through the early 1900s, 1920s, between the leaders of the church and the priesthood. And I say again, John W. Taylor was one of those who was first cut off the church because he would not give up his stand on celestial and plural marriage. They may have used other reasons, but that was the reason. I would like you to memorize these names so that as I bring their names into the stories you know who I'm talking about the apostles ordained by Lauren Woolley in 1929 up through 1932 know them in that order how to spell them and then the apostles ordained by John Y. Barlow 1941 through 49. Know them in order and the days or the years. I ask the teachers to keep up on your history effort and these stories. I'll tell a little more about Joseph F. Smith, John W. Taylor, and others as I start into the history of John Y. Barlow. That portion we're allowed to have. The Lord has blessed us to live so openly and free. The laws that our forefathers and these prophets suffered for. They were cursed, made fun of, their own families turned against them in many instances. Calling them wicked men because they would uphold the laws of the priesthood. But we today are receiving the blessing and benefit of their suffering. They suffered for us that we could exist, that we could enter into this law and live it also. So we're grateful for the prophets and those who stood by them. I say again, now it's our turn. We must come out of the world and be clean in order for the prophet to bless us in this law. <laughs>